Good morning, my brothers and sisters and all of our honored guests. God has blessed us with another Lord's Day. We hope everyone is doing well at this time. I have a few announcements before we go into our morning worship service. Brother George McCall requests prayers for his daughter, Charity McCall. Brother Manuel Beeman requests prayers for brother and sister Edward Hill of Newtown Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama on the recent loss of their daughter. Please keep all of us grieving lost loved ones in your prayers. Continued prayer for Sister Denise Draper and Eric Lacey's father, James Lacey, healing from his successful surgery. Sister Emma Brown and family for the Ely and Davis family, especially for Asiana Ely and Jochelle Davis for brother Amos Perry, now home from the hospital recovering from a recent fall. Brother Gary Wood requests prayers for his brother Andre, twin sisters Jan Stevens and Judy Bates and continued prayer for his brother Brother Albert Woods Jr. receiving hospice care at home for Sons Away Stewart and continued prayer for Sister Linda McLean, who is now home from the hospital, and all those dealing with health concerns. Prayer requests for Sister Jill King, Brother Willie Blackwood, Sister <clears throat> Patricia Gaines, Sister Cornelia Swings and all of our brothers and sisters who are shed in at this time. Remember, if you would like to Zoom into our Thursday Bible study, please email or call the church office to be added to the list. Our next food giveaway is this Tuesday, October the 20th from 10 a.m. until noon, and it will be in the parking lot in the parking lot. Those of all of our announcements for this morning. On our roster this morning will be Brother Greg Shields will be our song leader. Brother Donald Nelson will do the meditation scripture and prayer. Brother Terrence McLean will offer the sermon for this morning. Our communion will be led by Brother Amos Hicks. Offering announcements and benediction this morning will be by Brother Frank Barnes. Response facilitator will be Brother Freddie Gibson. You have been called to worship. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it's once again we bow before your throne of grace and mercy, thanking for you, you for this day that you have given us to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Father, for all of our guests that are listening in this morning. They are our special guests this morning. Please continue to bless Brother McLean and Sister McLean as Brother McLean continues to deliver your word without any addition or subtractions. We pray what we say, what we do today will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Again, good morning, everyone. It's um, so good to just know you're out there, uh, out there listening, enjoying, uh, enjoying in with the, um, with, with the service. Let's sing when morning comes, all right, Chuck? <clears throat> Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us into that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. And we will understand it better by and by. We're singing by 
in by Lord when the morning comes will and all the saints of God the gathering home and we will tell the story of how we overcome we will understand it better by and by and temptation hidden snares often take us unaware and our hearts are made to bleed for each thoughtless word or deed and we wonder why the tears when we try to do our best but we'll understand it better by and by we're singing by and by lord when the morning comes will and all the saints of god a gathering home and we will tell the story of how we overcome we will understand it better by and by. Good morning, family and friends. Our meditation for today comes from Titus, second chapter. Uh, we'll read verse one through six. Titus two, verses one through six. King James Version, of course. But speak thou the things that become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. To be that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exalt to be sober minded from Titus the second chapter verses one through six. For our Bible study this morning, we go to the book of Habakkuk, the prophet. Habakkuk, the third chapter, verses 17 through 19, our Bible study. King James Version. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hind's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. To the chief singer on my string instruments. From Habakkuk 3, verses 17 through 19. Now let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this occasion but you've allowed us to assemble our hearts and our spirits for the worship of, per of praise and serving you. We thank you, Lord, for having blessed us thus far, having awakened us, shaken us gently, and causing us to be among the land of the living once again. We thank you, Lord, for our university family. We thank you for the churches of Christ throughout the land and country and its ministers our minister, Brother Terrence McLean, and his wife, Sister McLean. Please, Lord, bless them. Please, Lord, bless him, bless him as he continue to minister your word. Bless the ministers 
in the city of Cleveland, Lord, who labor, spreading your word and teaching your word. And we just pray that they'll be strengthened and encouraged and we can keep up the good work. We come now, Lord, on behalf of those ministers of the university families and the churches of Christ who are sick and not well. We ask you to please bless them. We ask you to please watch over them. We ask you to please keep on encouraging them and keep them strong in faith. And when we come together once again, we pray that we can all reassemble ourselves in spirit. Lord, we ask a special blessing on those members of our family who've lost loved ones, those members of the family who are sick and not and, and afflicted. We just pray so much to you, Lord, for being our God. We thank you, Lord, for being a big, gracious Heavenly Father that we can bring all of our costs, all our cares to you and know that you will hear us and know that you will bless us. Help us, Lord, to continue serving you. Help us to continue worshiping and praising you. And bless us through this pandemic. Bless us in Jesus' name, Lord. Let us all say, Amen. We got word of some good news that Sister Brown is doing and attempting to bring out bring souls to Christ and uh, I want to tell you Sister Brown thank you and thank you very much and keep up uh, keep up the good work keep the good work I woke up this morning with my mind my mind it was stay on Jesus well I woke up this morning with my mind my mind it was stay on the Lord well, I I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind, it was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If for the bride we have striven, then after our labors are over, well, now rest to our souls will be given on that eternal show. For we have a home of the soul. It's a beautiful home they will rest. And never to roam, we're free from all care and with them there's no night oh, off in the storm we are sighing for home at the beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal who see yes beautiful home beside the crystal sea we are certainly thankful to god almighty for blessing all of us with the opportunity to come together and to worship him virtually on this platform on this another lord's day uh, we thank all of our, our brethren uh, Brother Frank Barnes, one of our elders, for ushering us into the presence of God Almighty on the, this morning. Uh, again, Brother Greg Shields, one of our elders, who is also an excellent song leader, thank you so much for leading us in praises to God Almighty. Uh, Brother Donald Nelson, our third elder, for doing the meditation, the reading of the scripture, and leading us to the throne of grace in prayer. Uh, we say thank you, Brother Donald, and we also say to uh, his beloved wife, Sister Ann, Annie Nelson, uh, a happy birthday to her today. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. May God richly bless you. Happy birthday to you. Uh, one of the elders even said that Brother Donald is, is a little more pep in his step and looking a little bit more bright on this morning uh, because he is just happy about his wife's birthday. Uh, we are thankful to God for Brother Amos Hicks, who has joined us on today. He will be leading us in the Lord's Supper. 
on uh, this morning in, in place of Brother Ray Knight, who was out of town. Uh, we're glad to have Brother Hicks with us. Uh, I've also been informed that he'll be joining us uh, regularly. He'll be doing our benediction as we go forward when Brother Ray returns. And so we are thankful to God uh, for him. Uh, we pray that as you have continued to do, uh, when we come to the offering, and Brother Frank Barnes, one of our elders, uh, does that aspect of our worship, uh, that you will continue to give as you have been giving. Thank you so very, very much. We know uh, it's a challenge. We know that it's, it's trying times. Uh, we know that this COVID-19 pandemic has begun to wear on each and every one of us. And we just want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. We want to thank you uh, for your faithfulness in joining us either on the teleconference call or via Facebook Live on Sunday mornings. Thank you for joining us on Wednesday uh, for our Bible study. And then now on Thursday on our Zoom platform for those who are members of the University Church of Christ, you join us as we study from the quarterly from the Gospel Advocate for Sunday morning's lessons and this coming uh, Thursday night, we're going to talk about God remembers Noah following the flood. We had a great study on this past Thursday. And if you have not yet called the church office or emailed the church office and given them your email address so that Brother Rick can send you the link so you can join us in that Zoom platform on Thursday, uh, please do so. Uh, I also want to make sure that I thank Brother Rick Winston uh, I just appreciate him so very, very much. Uh, he does a lot of things behind the scenes. He does a lot of things early on on Sunday mornings in order that we might present this virtual worship to you. Uh, he does a number of things that enable us to be able to bring Bible study on Wednesday and the Zoom Bible study on Thursday. Uh, just thank you, Brother, Brother Rick Winston. And of course, Brother Ray Knight is also on that technology ministry, as well as Brother Kevin Edmondson and Brother Freddie Gibson, one of our deacons. And Brother Freddie will be doing the responses on this evening. Uh, we're thankful not only for our elders and their families, we want you to continue to lift them in prayer. We are thankful for Brother Anthony uh, Slade and Brother Freddie Gibson, uh, our two deacons who also do so many things, not only to keep the building functioning, uh, but also working in various ministries around uh, the University Church of Christ and that food giveaway uh, that will be going on this coming Tuesday uh, is one of the major things that Brother Anthony Slay continues uh, to make available to those who are in need of food. So thank all of you and may God bless and keep you. Uh, I received word on yesterday, this is a little personal, I received word on yesterday, but Brother Earl Truss, uh, who was the longtime minister of what is now known as the Wayne Road Church of Christ. Uh, prior to that, it was the Wayne Course Church of Christ there in Romulus, uh, Michigan. Uh, in fact, it was the first congregation where I uh, was placed to serve as a minister of the gospel. Uh, after I'd obeyed the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Well, Brother Trust passed away on yesterday morning. Uh, he and I went to school together at the International School of Evangelism uh, way back in the mid 1970s. And our condolences to his wife, Lydia, their daughter, Daisy, their son, uh, as well as the Wayne Road Church of Christ and her minister, Brother Clifton Webb uh, Jr. and that entire congregation. So. Our condolences to that family. To those of you who are our guests who are not members of the Church of Christ, thank you for tuning in. Those who are from our sister congregations who may be tuning in throughout this great brotherhood of ours, thank you also for tuning in. But we're going to now go to God's holy and divine word. Uh, and before we do that, would you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Gracious and eternal Father who art in heaven, you are holy, you are righteous, you are just. It is in you that we move, we live, we have our very being. Father, thank you for your amazing grace, your grace and, and your mercy. You've allowed our lives to roll on a little while longer on the day and for this, we are ever thankful. 
Father, our prayer is that everything that we've done up to this moment in time during this virtual worship has been pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And Father, now I have the privilege of standing and sharing a thought from your word. I humble myself before you because I need you more than you need me. And Father, my prayer is that as I stand here and proclaim your word that I will glorify you. I will lift up Jesus that all will be drawn to him. That saints of God will be edified. Members of the University Church of Christ family as well as the body of Christ throughout the world. And that those who have not yet become Christians not obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that's been delivered to us through the New Testament word. Our prayer, oh God, is that you would convict them of the need of salvation that's in Christ and in him alone, even through this message, and that they will respond in humble obedience before it's everlasting and eternally too late. As Brother Greg has also thanked Sister Emma Brown, I too thank her for her continued sharing with those who are not yet members of the body of Christ. And we lift the young lady that she has been studying with, who has been to visit us when we were assembling and who has been joining us on these broadcasts as she thinks seriously about her obedience to the gospel of Christ. We ask you to protect her and keep her safe from the wicked one and that he's done not allowed to take the word that's been planted in her heart away from her and that she will indeed respond in humble obedience uh, as soon as possible before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Thank you for Jesus, your son, our Savior and our Lord, please be with all of our sick and shut in again, especially be with my wife, uh, Sister Linda. Uh, watch over, touch her body, restore the excellent health and strength. With my daughter Kimberly, who's also having health struggles there in Michigan, uh, serious health struggles, and we just ask you to please touch her body as well. Guide us and keep us in your loving care. In Jesus' name we pray ask these blessings, and we give these thanks. Amen. We have been studying from the book of Habakkuk. Studying from the book of Habakkuk. Back on September 27th, 2020, we studied from the subject, where is God when life doesn't make sense? And then on October 4th, 2020, we studied from the subject, enduring truth for enduring saints. Last week from the second chapter of Habakkuk, October 11th, we studied the subject, but the Lord is in his holy temple. And today now we've come to the fourth section of this series of lessons from the book of Habakkuk and our subject is entitled From Worry to Worship. From Worry to Worship. Brother Donald read from Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 17 through, through 19. Our lesson in actuality is going to come from verse number one all the way through verse number 19. But Habakkuk chapter three, verse 17 says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. But then he goes on and he punctuates it by saying, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my, my strength. There were two men attacked by a mob in the town square. The people were put off by the men's religious beliefs. So they beat them nearly to death. And just before they died, the local law enforcement intervened and threw them in jail. This was a long time ago. And at this time, they would fasten prisoners to the wall or in wooden constraints. But something strange happened on this day. 
In the middle of the night, these men with bloodied and bruised faces and aching bones from the abuse began singing hymns to God and praying aloud in the prison. What explanation could be given for such a response to these horrible circumstances? We know these men as Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. They were content in God. Therefore, their joy was not tied to favorable circumstances, but their joy was tied rather to a faithful God. And this is good news. Because if you are content in God, then your joy is untouchable. In our passage this morning, as we read the prayer from Habakkuk, he is promised some very difficult days ahead. But like Paul and Barnabas, he finds himself content, not in the circumstances he's anticipating, but in the God who he is trusting. I want to repeat that. That sounds pretty good to me. Like Paul and Barnabas, he finds himself content, not in the circumstances he's anticipating, but in the God who he is trusting. If I were to give you an outline for this final chapter of the book of Habakkuk, it would be four priorities for contentment. How do we go from worry to worship? The first point would be that we pray, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The second point would be that we remember Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. The third point would be to wait, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16. And then the fourth thing would be that we would rejoice, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Pray, remember, wait, rejoice. Let's talk about praying. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigeo, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known in wrath, remember mercy. This might sound like the right answer. You want to be content, then yes, you ought to pray. You want to be strong, but you have to admit that you are weak and you need help. And that's really hard in our life. It's unnatural for us to admit that we need help. You know what is natural. My life is really hard right now. I don't want to pray. I, I can't make sense of things, so I don't pray. I feel guilty for being weak. I feel guilty for not getting it. I feel guilty for not praying, so I don't pray. That's what happens in our lives. This is natural, but it's not healthy or is it helpful? And it's not what Habakkuk does. This prayer to God comes in the midst of a difficult time. It's a hard season. He doesn't understand why certain things are happening. He doesn't get why the people who don't follow God seem to have it all, and those who do follow God keep getting it between the eyes. What's more, he doesn't get why God would allow it to happen and even ordain it to happen. Mark it down that we don't pray because we have it all figured out. We pray because we don't have it all figured out. We don't pray because we are content. We pray because we are not content. Habakkuk is coming to God in prayer with more questions than answers. But the questions he has answered are very important. He believes that God hears him. He believes that God is a good God. He believes that God is holy. He believes that God will do what is right. He believes that God is worthy of his trust. And so he prays. Does hardship and uncertainty draw you to prayer or does it repel you from prayer? Does it bring you to God or does it push you further away from God? Does it create intimacy or does it create distance? We are meant to learn here that hardship and uncertainty ought to bring us closer to God. 
This only becomes more instructive as we consider what he prays. Look with me at verse number two. It says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk here in his prayer recounts to the Lord in his prayer that he has heard the report of him and heard the report of his word. But you'll notice that Habakkuk fears and then he makes a couple of requests. What does this mean? There are a couple of ways to take this. You may look at this and say that Habakkuk is saying in verse 2 that he had heard of how God has worked in the past in saving people, but yet he is fearful, perhaps, of how the process will play out. Then he prays for God to revive the same saving actions again. It's certainly possible, but I don't think in light of the book of Habakkuk and the context that this is the best way to take what he is saying. Another way is to zero in on this word work in verse number two. Has he used this word anywhere else in this book? Yes, he has. In verse five of Habakkuk chapter one, God said, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. What is this work that God says he's going to work in Habakkuk's days, that he wouldn't believe it if God told him about it? The work he's talking about is the work of judgment. We have seen that in chapters 1 and in chapter 2. And what is the logical response of Habakkuk to this judgment? It is fear. He considers it and it makes him tremble. He knows that the judgment of God upon Judah is not going to be pleasant. And so now he is bracing himself for it. But then he says, revive it. Revive what? Is he talking about reviving the judgment? No, he doesn't have to revive that because that's coming. That would be a strange prayer. The word here that's translated a revive means to live. It's another word that has a prominent place in the book of Habakkuk. You may already be thinking of it because back in Habakkuk chapter two and verse four, I believe this is the heart of the book. He says, the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous, that is the believers, that is those of us under the new covenant, the Christians are living by enduring faith. I told talked about that two weeks ago, enduring truth for enduring faith. This is the request then that they have faith to endure in the midst of the certain fearful work of God. He goes on further and says, in the midst of the years, make it known. This refers to the time in between God pronouncing to Habakkuk what he's going to do and God doing what he's going to do. It's between the time of announcement and fulfillment. And he's saying, make known the record of divine revelation. Let people know what is in this book. Let them hear the truth of who you are as God and your promises to make all things right. Make it known that you are in your holy temple. He is asking for his book to go viral amongst the people of God to use our modern vernacular. You can't help here, but think of the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He too considered the work of God, God's judgment. He too trembled at the sight of the cup. He burned, he turned the will of God over in his hand like a coin to be studied. And he too retired to his father in prayer and pleaded with God in faith with pleas of dependence. And he too pleaded with God to make it known this path that was paid for Habakkuk was walked by our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is to be walked by you and I as well. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be, be done. 
But then Habakkuk pleads for mercy amidst the judgment. In your wrath, remember mercy. This is where the difference with our Lord Jesus emerges in God's wrath. Jesus received no mercy in God's wrath. He received every bit of it. But this was so you and I would get mercy. He died on the cross for our sins. He paid a debt that he did not owe for a crime that he did not commit. So that you and I could receive some amazing grace and some mercy. It might shock you to read that Habakkuk admits that he is afraid. It's a bit of an unvarnished prayer. He's not trying to impress God. Do you think God is put off by you coming to him with fear sometimes? Can God handle our fear? Does he want us to bring him our anxious thoughts? Does a father want his little girl or his little boy to speak to him about their fears, about their uncertainties, about their anxieties? I think that a father does. And we need to see that it was the weakness of fear that leads Habakkuk to cling to the oak of divine mercy. He needs mercy. He needs help. And when you and I look around at the society that we live in, when we look around and we look at this country in which we dwell, when we look around and see the entire world that has lost its way. What do we need? We need some mercy and we need some grace. Do you think of God's mercy as only that which comes to you at salvation and then it never comes again? I want to remind those of you who are members of the body of Christ and those who may not be members of the body of Christ, that we have a God who is merciful to his people. We have a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. It's a God who has allowed us to hear the gospel, which is his power unto salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. 16. It's a God who has had us to respond in humble obedience to that gospel. And so now we are able to praise God and the Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved because they've heard the gospel, believe the gospel, repented of their sins, confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son and been buried in water for the remission of sins. But I stopped by to remind you today that the mercy of God God did not stop at our initial obedience to the gospel of Christ, that God delights to continue to show mercy to every one of us. In fact, in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, the King James Version says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. You and I are still alive today because of God's mercy, because God is merciful. He hasn't taken us from this world because he is merciful. He is letting people continue to live, to get their act together because he's not desirous that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Why? Because great is thy faithfulness. You and I receive new mercy for the day. And if God allows us to wake up in the morning, we'll get some new mercy then. And when he says it's new mercy, he's not talking about the quantity of the mercy. He is talking about the quality of the mercy. And what he is saying is that God gives you and I every day that he allows us to get up and see the light of a new day. He gives us mercy on that day to handle the challenge that come our way on that day. The Lord is my passion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in, in him. In the MacArthur Study Bible, in talking about Lamentations 3.22, he uses that, he tells us that this word mercy, the Hebrew word is used about 250 times in the Old Testament, and it refers to God's gracious love. It is a comprehensive term that encompasses love, grace, mercy, goodness, forgiveness, 
truth, compassion, and faithfulness. What a mighty God we serve. When facing the crucibles of life and death, when we are at our weakest, trembling in fear, we can remember Habakkuk's prayer. God, I'm afraid. Help me to live by enduring faith. Let me cling to your word. And in my trembling, God, remember mercy. Habakkuk's contentment comes through prayer. And since his contentment is in God, his joy is untouchable. Number one, pray. Number two, remember. Habakkuk chapter three, verse three through 15. God came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thou bow was made quite naked According to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Salah, thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear, thou didst march through the land in indignation, thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the net, Salah. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. In order to have comfort in the present, Habakkuk remembers what God has done in the past. This is so encouraging because God does not change. In Psalm 102, verse 27, the Bible says, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, the Bible says, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. As we look briefly at these verses, I want us to consider what, how, and why he prays. What, how, and why he prays. First, what he prays. We read in verse three of Timon and Mount Paran. What is there about these two locations form the boundaries of Israel's journey through the desert? This is the path that God led the people out of Egypt. Why might this be significant to the people of God? Remember their situation. They are presently under Assyrian captivity and they are soon to be under Babylonian rule. They have been or will soon be evicted from the promised land. Like Canaan before them, they will be ejected from the land because of their idolatry. And now we hear read of the king of kings coming to judge his people, reminiscent of how he led the people to possess the land, he comes again now in judgment upon them while they are in the land that God gave them. You can trust God. He is faithful to keep his promise. He anticipates that God will judge in the future in a manner that is consistent with his past work. Then Habakkuk remembers two enemies of God's people that overlays their activity as a template for future judgment. 
Cushan in verse 7, back in Judges 3, we learn that Israel rebelled against God. They did not keep his commandments and they went after other gods. God raised up Cushan to come and chasten them. But then he also raised up a deliverer, Othniel, to defeat them and restore his people. Midian in verse 7, this ten of Midian recalls a scene when Gideon was judging or leading the people of God. And in Judges 7, Gideon overhears of a dream where there was horror in the tents of Midian because one of the soldiers had a dream about a loaf of barley that came trembling into their camp, tumbling into their camp. And Gideon overhearing and consequently reassured went on the attack against them and he destroyed them. What, Brother McLean, what's the point? Glad you asked. God's past works of judgment and deliverance are a template which Habakkuk lays over the future. He prays with recollection and anticipation of God's final triumph for himself and his people. He had confidence that while the world around him, including kings and kingdoms, would perish, ultimately he would not. Ultimately, God would restore his people. Then we think about how he prays. Habakkuk shifts to talking about God in terms that has us thinking about a warrior. We see in verse 8, God triumphing over the river and seas. He is like a mighty warrior, even more than the Babylonians in their high-tech military achievement. He is seen here with a chariot of salvation. He has strength, power, and honor. He has a bow and arrow, verse number 9. And with a view toward conquering his enemies, Habakkuk is praying the past works of God in triumph upon the future. He is saying that this final triumph is what he is trusting God to do. And in verses 10 through 15, there's a vivid depiction of God's triumph over his enemies. Habakkuk, after having his mind and heart trained upon who God is, looks back upon the past and remember God's triumph over his enemies through Moses, over his enemies through Joshua, and over his enemies through David. He is remembering God's powerful victories, and he says in verse 13, thou winnest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the net, Salah. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 13 in the New American Standard Bible reads this way. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Selah. Do you see how specific Habakkuk is in his prayers? Oh, he could have just prayed with simplicity. God, just like you did in the past, defeat your enemies and save your people. That would have been faithful, good, and true, but he does something more. He seems to be mulling over, reviewing the details, meditating upon the truth of these victories. He seems here yeah, to really love God and to be so filled with the joy of seeing him in that he is quite liberal with his word. He's going on and on about the victories. He is playing the greatest hits and singing along in prayer. He's saying, Lord, do it again. Let me ask you a question on this morning. How, how familiar are you with the works of God? Do you know the works of God in general? Do you know the works of God in your life? Do you rehearse them? Do you boast in them? Do you declare them in prayer? Do you talk to others about them? This leads to the why of this prayer. He loves God. This is why he prays like this. He has his heart and his mind gripped by the Lord Jesus Christ, God. So he, he prays. And now he waits. Hmm. Look at verse number 16. When I heard my belly trembled, 
My lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones. I, I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. You know, it's hard to wait. We don't want to do it. We would love to microwave these periods of impatience. You and I have said it more than once over the past few weeks, over the past few months, and probably even over the past few days. Lord, would you hurry up and get us out of this COVID-19 pandemic? Lord, would you hurry up and answer our prayer for healing of our bodies that seem to be breaking down? Lord, would you hurry up and get us through this election cycle? Because I'm tired of all of the bitterness and the backbiting and all of the craziness that's going on. But Backup says, God says, wait. It's especially hard to wait when you know there's great difficulty laid before you. That's what Habakkuk is facing. He's not waiting for vacation. He's waiting for an invasion. It's not his promised comfort that he's waiting for, but it's his promised discomfort. He's awaiting the hard days ahead. They are looming like dark clouds over the horizon, and we see how he feels it so acutely. Verse number 16 in the NIV says this, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Habakkuk is feeling this. He's swishing around. The bitterness of the days of difficulty lying ahead in his mouth. He's shaking. His lips are quivering. He feels like he's rotting from the inside. His knees are knocking. I'm sure that there have been times when you have been involuntarily seized by the anxiety of a moment. You feel your heart race. Your knees knock. Your stomach turns. It's the first thought of the morning. It's the last thought of the night. You know what he's talking about. How do you deal with this? Let's learn from Habakkuk here. Acknowledging his predicament, he says, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. He says that he'll wait. He'll wait for what? The day of trouble or the day of judgment to come on those who invade. I just need to reset this for your thinking. He's talking about Babylon and he's referring back to God's promised judgment upon them. God has told Habakkuk that in the end, he is going to make everything right. Those whom he dreads so much will feel and know justice. He's letting the promise of the future determine his current state of mind. In other words, he is living by faith in God and his promises. This is a remarkable transformation for Habakkuk, isn't it? He has gone from a warrior to a worshiper. He went from how long to I will wait. He has gone from you don't hear me to I hear you. He has gone from where is justice to I tremble at the thought of justice. He has gone from uncomfortably uncertain to uncomfortably certain. He went from worry to worship. And what brings him there? It's the revelation of God through his word. Brothers and sisters of the University Church of Christ and brothers and sisters from this great brotherhood of ours and those of you who are our guests who are not yet Christians, listen to me very closely. What brings him from worry to worship is the revelation of God through the word. It's the Bible. He is content. He is resting and trusting and 
treasuring God amid the dark clouds of adversity. His contentment, his joy cannot be wrestled from him because he's trusting in the God of the word through the word of God. Think about this for a moment. This is the worst possible news for Habakkuk. His country is going to be invaded. His sacred spaces desecrated. His people will be abused and taken hostage. This is horrible news. And yet he clings to a sure word from God. He trusts him. He believes that in the end, God will make it right. God has made promises. Let me ask you today, what would be the worst possible news for you? Grab on to the fact of what you consider would be your worst news and think about it. How would you live through it? How could you make it while swishing around this bitter and painful taste in your mouth? The Bible's answer is this, live by an enduring faith in God. Even on that horrible day, God still reigns. Facing death, disaster, disgrace, or other great pain, know that God is in his holy temple. Habakkuk not only says he will wait, but that he will quietly wait. He is content in God. He is not going to grumble at God. He's going to trust in God. He, that is God, will make it right. And Habakkuk says in chapter 2, verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. You see, this morning, there was another faithful servant who was promised a day of trouble. And he quietly trusted God in his word. You might remember that Jesus immensely felt the hour of adversity in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was sweating drops of blood. His soul was deeply distressed. He cried out in prayer to God his Father, but his resounding prayer was, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In Matthew 26, 39, he trusted God. He believed that even under death, God would raise him from the dead. The promises of God transcend this life in all of its troubles. They even transcend the grave. So Christ powerfully conquered death and purchased life for all of his people. And this is what you and I need to remember today. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8 verse 32. We've got to wait. Then lastly, we've got to rejoice. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 through 19. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my stringed instrument. Take special note of verse 17 with me, if you would. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. This is quite a punctuation at the end of this book. He's talking about all of the blessings of life. Many of these were staples for them as a people. Should the figs, the fruit, the olives, and the flock all be gone, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice. Should the grocery stores be empty or the 401k disappear or the water no longer flows from our faucets and though we have nothing and are reduced to nothing yet, 
I will rejoice. What? Why? How? Why? I will joy in the God of my salvation. How? The Lord God is my strength. Here is where we find something amazing about being content in God. When you are content in God, your joy is untouchable. Why? Because our joy is not tied to our circumstances. Our joy is tied to God's character. The circumstances can't be worth a backup says, but her backup says, I'm still going to rejoice. Right now in our world, in our country, in this state, in this city, we feel like our circumstances can't get worse. We don't know how much longer COVID-19 is going to go on. We don't know how much confusion there's going to be in the medical field about healing folks with COVID-19. We, we don't know how many more folk are going to lose their jobs. We don't know how many of us are going to be cut off from finances. We don't know how many loved ones are going to die. And yet Habakkuk says to you and I that we ought to yet rejoice. Because our joy is bound up in God means that we can face anything. And it cannot be touched. It's untouchable. There are three implications as I close this book of Habakkuk. Faith isn't abandoned at times like this, but strengthened when calamity comes. Number two, faith reads circumstances in light of God's character. And number three, faith doesn't see God as a means to an end, but as the actual end himself. You and I can go from worry to, to worship. Our God is an amazing God. And I got up early this morning and did my, my, my devotionals and and I said to the elders and Brother Hicks earlier that not only did I do my devotional, I spent an entire hour just praying because we need God. Now, you might not need God. I need God. My wife needs God. Her family needs God. We got word that one of our brothers is tested positive for COVID-19. And, and as she said, how do we handle that? What, what do we do with that? with all of her pain and suffering that I can do nothing about. What, what, what do I do with that? I simply give it to God and trust him to make everything all right. And then as I was doing my devotionals, and it's interesting because I go to this Bible gateway and I have a number of the devotionals that I read. And, and, and the last one that I read, read is called the Stewardship Bible. And it was so funny this morning, this devotional came from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. And, and in this devotional, it says Habakkuk is deeply changed. His response in 3, verse 16 through 19, clearly illustrates what it means to live by faith in God's promise. After a moment's recuperation from the cosmic events that he has just witnessed, the prophet declares, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Habakkuk 3.16. Habakkuk is willing to live amid socioeconomic upheaval without physical or financial safety or security. Why? Because he knows a day is coming when things will be changed. The following anonymous email has circulated on the internet. Recently, I overheard a mother and daughter in their last moments together at the airport. They had announced the departure. Standing near the security gate, they hugged and the mother said, I love you and I wish you enough. The daughter replied, mom, our life together has been more than enough. Your love is all I ever needed. I wish you enough too, mom. 
They kiss and the daughter left. The mother, the mother walked over to the window where I was seated. Standing there, I could see she wanted and needed to cry. I tried not to intrude on her privacy, but she welcomed me in by asking, did you ever say goodbye to someone knowing it would be forever? Yes, I have, I replied. Forgive me for asking, but why is this a forever goodbye? I am old and she lives so far away. I have challenges ahead and the reality is the next trip back will be for my funeral, she said. When you were saying goodbye, I heard you say, I wish you enough. May I ask what that means? She began to smile. That's a wish that has been handed down from other generations. When we said, I wish you enough, we were wanting the other person to have a life filled with just enough good things to sustain them. I wish you enough sun to keep your attitude bright no matter how gray the day may appear. I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive and everlasting. I wish you enough pain so that even the smallest of joys in life may appear bigger. I wish you enough loss to appreciate all that you possess. I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive and everlasting. I wish you enough hellos to get you through the final goodbye. I say to you, members of the University Church of Christ and those of you who are members of the body of Christ elsewhere, and even those of you who are not members of the body of Christ, who are not yet Christians, I, I do more than wish something for you. I, I pray for you today that if you've not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you will hear how Jesus loved you so much that he died on the cross for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he got up the third day according to the scriptures and declare now I've got all power in heaven and in earth and he ascended back to heaven and is on the right hand of God and one day he's coming back again I, I pray that you will know that God loved you so much that rather than spend eternity without you he sent his only begotten son to die for you I pray that you will go cut through the confusion of religion in our world and doctrines contrary to the world of God and that you will hear and obey the truth of the gospel of Christ for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek I do more than wish I pray for those of you who are members of the body of Christ that no matter what you're going through, I know that dark times are around us, but no matter what you're going through, whether it's a health challenge, whether it's a financial challenge, whether it's an uncertainty about the future, whether it's a loved one with a positive COVID-19 test, whether it's something that you're afraid of because your body doesn't feel so well, that no matter what you're going through, my prayer is that you will reach up and you will hold on to God's unchanging hand, that you will remember the words of the song, time is filled with swift transition, not of things unmoved shall stand, build your hope on things eternal, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Those of you who are not Christians, you can become one today, don't put it off. Now look at the side of the Facebook you'll see the, the telephone number of the church as well as the website, how you can reach us and we'll help you in your obedience to the gospel of Christ. We may not be in the building assembly, but we'll get you to the water. Like the old folk down south used to say, take me to the water to be baptized. If you hear how Jesus died for you, believe it, repent of your sins, confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son and be buried in water for the remission of your sins. You can arise to walk in the newness of life. And though it might look like calamity is before us and all around us, we don't know when it's going to end. But God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hold on, children of God. God is with us. When Jesus came, his name meant God with us, Emmanuel. 
But he also promised in Matthew 28, I'll be with you even unto the end of the world. Brother Freddie Gibson is going to take your prayer requests, your confessions. And even if you call, well, you will let us know you want to be obedient to the gospel. You'll get an opportunity to, to do that. And on behalf of the elders, the deacons, my wife and our ministry, and all the saints of the University Church of Christ to everyone, I want you to remember to do something only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, remember that God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. As Brother Greg leads us in the verse of an invitation song. Oh, my trials. Oh, my kids. I can tell them to my Lord and heal my burden and be well through the pain and the strain only Jesus brings me hope through all my trials my trials what another wonderful message from brother brother McLean on this, on this morning <clears throat> Um, before brother brother Hicks comes to you, uh, let's sing a verse. Uh, sing a verse of a song for our uh, for our communion, our communion with our Lord and Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know. Eternal life he, he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. At this time, we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. For over two millennium, the faithful have come to partake in this meal that gives us eternal life. We do it because Christ has told us to do this in remembrance of him. In math, in the uh, Mark, the 14th chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. The Bible tells us, and as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it, break it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup when he had given thanks and gave it to them, and they all drank it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have loved us so much that you have sacrificed your son, that through him we could have life everlasting. We're thankful, Father, that he loved us so much that he gave his life and he suffered, was killed, descended into the Hadean world, conquered death and came back that the debt of our sins could be paid 
and that we could have life and that more abundantly. Father, we ask that we come with clean hands and pure hearts as we partake of this sacrament. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes down, everybody ought to praise him, go ahead and praise him. Him. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the noontime, praise him, praise him, praise him when the sun goes down. We have again come to the portion of our service where we have an opportunity to give unto the Lord a portion of what he has given us. I will be reading from 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning with verse number six. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he prospers in his heart. So let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace and mercy, thanking you for all that you have given us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you allowed to die on our behalf. We pray, Father, that we remember all these things as we give into your treasury. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name, amen. Remember, this is our week for the uh, food giveaway this Tuesday from the hours of 10 to 12, it will be on the parking lot once again from 10 to 12 on this Tuesday, October the 20th. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, as we go through another week, as we walk through this continued valley of the virus that you continue to bless us with your grace and your mercy, that we continue to hold on to your unchanging hands because the, vic the victory has already been won. Be with us, continue to bless Brother McLean, Sister McLean, all of our sick and shed in so that they may one day when we gather again together to worship you in spirit and truth. This is our prayer in your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. Until I die. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. 
till I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield until I die, until I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield until I die. Ah. Uh...